we're looking at the work of the artist Luke Wade, who made this dry point etching following the Grenfell Tower disaster in 2017. In 2004, the critic Robert Hughes questioned the validity of much contemporary art, saying that it is so very often a symptom of each artist's own personal phobias, and went on to ask a further question. How would Turner have painted the mushroom cloud, or Goya, the liberation of Belson? Well, this etching to me is a direct response to that challenge and a fitting tribute to the 72 people who died that night. If nothing else, what we can see here is an artist marshalling 600 years of prior knowledge and technique to create an image which is very contemporary indeed. I want to ask Luke his opinions of the Comparaton Mirror, a little device which over five years of research I've discovered puts the skills of purely realistic drawing and painting at the fingertips of almost anyone. I'm keen to find out if he thinks this cheapens the process by missing the point, or if demystifying pure technique will allow more people to question why an artwork is what it is. This is the Artichoke Print Studio in Brixton in London and this is Luke Wade hard at work on the hottest day we've ever had in Britain, which is probably why he's wearing next to no clothing. As a painter myself, I haven't been in a print studio as well equipped as this for over 10 years and I was struck by how technical the whole business is, how dependent it is upon measured decision making and an adherence to technique whilst using a variety of different bits of hardware. In many respects, it's a world away from the free-form decision-making and the trained instincts of painting. In any case, let's begin at the beginning. I don't really remember starting. It was more like it was just a thing that I always did. Um, I drew in pads, just, just go through whole pads of paper. My granddad's study, where he had all these lovely sharpened pencils, all machine sharpened. He had one of those sort of table-mounted rotary sharpeners, which in itself was fascinating. Lovely fine liners. They were all immaculately sharp all the time. So even if I blunted them, I'd come back and they'd be standing there to attention. So was that before any experience of yeah. drawing and painting at school? Was That was, yeah. And what sort of age was that? I mean, that, that just pops into my mind, but I, that was probably like year three. Year three would have been just the turning point between going from the infants into the juniors. I didn't really think about grades until secondary school. We used to get, I used to get a great big piece of paper and we'd all draw on this big piece of paper. But I mean, I was mainly the one, because I took it home, so I was the one that was mainly drawing on it, but people would join in mm. and it would be like a kind of an almost interactive story. But that was, that was just, that was recreational. There wasn't any like focus on on, on like who can do a good drawing. It, it was only when you went to, you were doing art lessons in the in secondary school sense that things became like, this is good, this is bad. You yeah. were actually getting kind of elevated above your peers or distinguished in some way. Do many of the people you went to school with understand what you do now? In a, in a sort of a cursory sense, but I lose them somewhere along the lines when I'm sort of saying about why I'm doing what I'm doing, where it's going, or mm. if it's going anywhere. They, they, they just sort of stop it like, oh, that's good, and, and that's fine, because I don't think they see it in a sort of a context that they can understand. They can see it on a gallery wall and they go, oh, that's that. But then beyond that, the whole pursuit of it eludes them, I think. And yes and no, I think less so these days because you're exposed to a lot more images just by merit of social media. You see more images and you see more art just by being on Instagram. But what that kind of art is and actually seeing something in the flesh and appreciating it enough beyond just sort of going, oh, that's worth a thumb press on my phone versus going to a gallery and seeing it. There's still a, a resistance to that and that still doesn't quite take hold. People, yeah. People like the idea of it more but maybe they don't that doesn't mean that they're actually going to go to a gallery people are still pretty much 
entrenched with whether they like it or not. If they like it, they like it. They don't, they don't. Mm. You say there's a reluctance to think, I don't understand this. I wonder why I don't. What is the artist trying to communicate? There's a reluctance to do that, would you say? To, to meet the work halfway? People what? like to know. They like to be like, that's, that's what that is. And this is when I'm talking to people that aren't in the art world. They, they don't seem willing to, to yeah, venture much more than that, in let, less they're wrong, perhaps. I'm not, I'm not sure. That I had the paints there and I was, I was just putting things down and it was, I could at any point see where the image was headed and I, and I, I quickly knew that no matter what happened, I, if I just kept working at this thing, it would look as it looked on the picture, it would look as it looked. Yeah. So the, the device was doing all the work for you? No, I was having to do the work, I was having to make those marks, I was having to decide where they went, but I could at any point see where it was heading. So there was no fear of going off course. There was no fear of making a, a, an irreparable mistake. There was there was just a sort of a comfort that, okay, with enough time, I can make this as photorealistic as I as I sort of yeah. wish it to be. So then, moving on to your own experience as a printmaker, you make dry point etchings. Have you used the comparative mirror in your own practice now? I knew very quickly that this would work for printmaking in various ways. And it took me a little bit of time messing around with ideas in my head to, dis to determine how it was going to work. But I thought I can turn this to drawing on plates because there's always this chance of things going wrong on plates. There's always this chance of, of mistakes happening that then are quite costly in terms of time to repair. This eliminated that, and I, I started turning it towards a certain project. So it was useful. Oh yeah, no, 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 no. I'm, I've, I've, I'm really excited by it. I know I'm going to be able to do some quite impressive things with it, mm -hmm. and they'll be impressive not only by merit of how they're going to hopefully look in the end, but on a on a technical basis, it's going to, it's going to be very, very challenging and very interesting to work mm -hmm. with. But a good a good challenge, like a challenge that I know much like with the painting and the drawing, that it's just a matter of time before I crack it. It can't go too wrong. I feel very confident about embarking on something that maybe I wouldn't have necessarily if it was freehand, I don't know. If free, well, it is freehand, but yeah, without so, the support of this So thing. just describe to me how it is freehand. Do you think it's cheating? It's, it's or is, is it tracing? or It's supported, so it's not done for you um but you've 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 got a framework with which to work within and make mistakes or not make mistakes um and that's entirely at your discretion but you still have to make those marks you can't do that yeah um without putting a, a brush to a plate or a pen to paper or, or what have you what you're describing is that the cogs are still turning around in your head as you're mm. using the comparator mirror yeah yeah um it doesn't it doesn't do the drawing for you, it doesn't take the work out of it for you, and it certainly doesn't solve its own problems. Like tracing would? Yeah, yeah, because tracing is like, well, there is no problem anymore with tracing. There's the images on the paper, and then you're just kind of reinforcing it. It's already there. You still have to put the image on the paper. You still have to draw. Mm. You just don't have to worry too much about making completely catastrophic mistakes that will invalidate all the time you spent on it. So... It's, it's still you drawing, it still feels honest, it still feels yeah. true. Oh yeah, absolutely, I, without a doubt. I, I, what, um, yeah, I fully think it's going um, to it's gonna, it's gonna change how kids who might not feel confident in their own right uh, just, just drawing and getting it wrong will realise that it's not so much about getting it wrong or getting it right. This takes the, that that whole binary opposition out of it. It just gives you room to explore what, what it is to actually draw and what it is to make a, a mark. It doesn't even necessarily have to look exactly like the mark that's, that you're trying to replicate. It's your own mark, but you're, it gives you the confidence to make it and put it on paper and not worry too much about what it is you're doing and whether it's you know correct. So have you seen the interview I did with Julian Perry? <laughs> I've still not seen it, no. Uh, that's fine, I only posted yeah. it a few days ago. Uh, so Julian said that 
the comparative mirror to him was like torture because it broke the beautiful, fluid, lyric process of making an image. It, it, can, conf yes, it can confine you to an area you're working and if you're given over to working in, in a very controlled way you might be sucked into that, ensnared slightly by it. But that doesn't mean to say that you have to. You don't have to. You don't have to feel like that. You can step away from it and make bolder marks completely independently of it. It's, it's just a crutch and it's there if you need it and it's, it, can, it can be ignored. What happens is if you start striving for something that is perfect or is exact, then you might have problems because you, you're at odds. You'll, if you switch up your way of working part way through, you have to reconcile that. You have to reconcile this, this kind of seductive vision almost, little mirror, little window of perfection with your own marks and and some people will find that really internally frustrating they'll either think well I could just do this myself and I would do it straight away and off the cuff or they would feel that it doesn't quite match up and it inhibits them so I can it is it isn't entirely effortless to use it can feel supported but it's much like walking with a crutch you see you know you, you're not going to find that that's Instantly, oh, look, this is the most organic thing in the world. You know, you, you've got a, a, a sort of a surrogate limb, um, and it's as much as you want to rest on it or not that kind of determines how well you're gonna you're gonna use it. I think that's yeah. how I feel about it. It's lovely to talk to you. Well, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure, mate. It's a pleasure. It's been a pleasure using this thing. We can do some good stuff. So the, the gist of it is I would be aquatinting this plate, no, polishing it obviously it's all covered, polishing it all up, aquatinting it, setting it up with the mirror and then this as my templates. And they I've broken down the image into twelve layers and I've started with light to dark. So this is the first layer. And what I'm stopping out, what you see here, this black, all of this is going to be painted varnish onto this plate onto the aqua tinted surface, preserving, in this case, white. That's the first layer, it's always, always white's the first layer. Once I've painted all of that on, I'll take this off and pin this one back up using these little corners that I've, I've put down as uh, guides to keep everything kind of in registration. I take down the one that I've just painted once it's finished and I put this one up in the exact same spots using these little um, X's as registration guides and then I paint more on top. So as you can see from this one to the next one, they're getting slightly darker. And what I'm doing is I'm increasing, I'm widening these areas with more stop out. But in between each of these layers, this is being etched. So it's filling this whole plate with, with total information, degree of gray. Each stopping out is preserving a layer of that gray before I then etch it again to darken the grey and so on and so forth for 12 layers until eventually the final layer will be well like the cumulative I don't know two minutes of, of etching so which will leave black information that'll be the final layer and then I'll clean it all off and I should have a I mean it sounds like a pretty complex print it's yeah it's 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 not um, in principle it's not complex this is, this is how you do an aqua tint what makes it complex and where the comparison mirror comes in is it doesn't um, it's giving me a ridiculous degree of accuracy, which wouldn't be as easily attained by by natural methods, because you're you're painting straight onto a surface that's already treated with a with a with a resin dust. You you can clean it up to an extent, but you risk damaging that aquatint layer. So you you pay for your mistakes. Basically. Yeah, absolutely. And and with all things in print. The, the mistakes are, are, are very costly in terms of time and materials. So this can give me that precision at very, hopefully, minimal cost in terms of time and error. And the re end results, providing my testing works and my registration stays crisp, should be really quite impressive. Like a like a very, a, a very very detailed tonally built painting with no line. There's going to be no line, much like the Vermeers. There's no uh, there's no sort of underpinning drawing to kind of 
key it all in, it will just be tone upon tone upon tone upon tone upon tone. Thanks, Luke. That's well, great. <laughs> no, I'm, great. Re I'm really excited about it. I think it's going to be good. I think it's going to be good fun. Well, I think that was another really interesting chat. Quite different in tone to my conversation with Julian Perry a few weeks ago. And whilst I'm going to try to resist coming to any concrete conclusions here, although you're perfectly welcome to do that, when I think back to what Julian Perry said about his practice and about the comparator mirror, there are a few useful things to talk about, I think. The first would be that Luke also talked about acquiring a personal, intimate relationship with drawing and painting. He talked about his grand the pencils in his grandfather's study and about making big communal drawings with the kids at his primary school before drawing and painting art became a serious prospect later on in secondary school. And that was quite convenient with what Julian Perry had said about his early experiences. It'll be interesting to see if the other artists I talked to share those sorts of sentiments. Generally, Luke's tone about the comparator mirror was totally different to Julian, who described it as being like torture. Luke, on the other hand, saw it not only as a practical, useful device to incorporate within his own practice, something that he said would save him a lot of time and a lot of unnecessary angst in the print studio, before going on to be quite enthusiastic about its potential as a way to encourage children and people with low confidence to draw and paint. In all of this, I'm, I'm trying not to prompt the artists and the individuals that I talk to about the comparator mirror. And so I wanted to press Luke on the subject of cheating. And he seemed to be fairly convinced that it wasn't that, that the cognitive, the mental processes involved in drawing, painting and printmaking still have to take place, but that you feel held. This was totally different to Julian's opinion of the comparator mirror, who was keen to warn me about the dangers of oversimplifying uh, problems as deep and as complex and as fascinating as drawing and painting. Where Luke saw opportunity, a chance to approach the old processes of printmaking, dry point etching, from a different angle to acquire a tool for his toolkit, Julian saw it as restrictive, as limiting the capacity to learn something from painting and drawing. And I can't help but feel that that has something to do, not with a difference in age, but with a difference in experience. Julian has spent decades refining his artistic language, his toolkit, so that now his approach to painting, the way that he manipulates paint on the surface of the picture, is a deliberate and considered reflection of the way that he thinks about the world. To Luke, on the other hand, at the very beginning of his career, in a position where he's still assembling his toolkit, the comparator mirror seemed to present nothing but pure opportunity, the possibility to find a new way in to the ancient traditions of printmaking. A way to question the accepted wisdom, of course, but also to develop an extra tool for his toolkit that his peers are simply unaware of. I'm not going to try to split hairs here and say whose opinion was more correct, but I think it's interesting to note the differences and to speculate as to why that might be. If Luke manages to make the comparator mirror work for him in his dry point process, he will have found a solution to a problem that's frustrated printmakers for centuries, and it will be interesting to see how much more complex his print work will become as a result. If he manages to achieve this, it will be hard to see these results as anything but positive. In the coming month, I'm going to be posting two more videos with other artists whose opinions I think will dovetail really interestingly with Julian Perry's interview and with this one. I'm also going to be posting a short documentary rounding up all of the comparator mirror experiments I've been doing over the last 18 months with institutions all over the world, with schools based here in the UK, and individuals who've got in touch with me through this YouTube channel. Thank you to everyone who's done that. If you found this video interesting, informative, or if you think this mad experiment of mine is useful, uh, please do click the like button, please do subscribe, and if you're feeling brave, whatever your opinion may be, leave me a comment. It all helps to add detail and depth to the conversation that I'm trying to have here about traditional techniques and progressive attitudes. Until next time then, thanks very much for watching.